Hi, uh, so I'm Eric, uh, and I, thank you very much, Lori, for the kind introduction. It's, it's actually it's a um, such an honor to be uh, presenting to a group that is involved in such important work. And I'm going to be presenting with my co-author and my colleague, uh, Dr. Derek Matthews, today. We're going to kind of tag team you, so I'm going to start first, and then I'll hand it over to him, and then I'm going to finish up the presentation. So first, I just want to start with a brief outline for today's talk. We're going to first situate the results of Caprice and IPAS trials in the landscape of chemoprophylaxis by just briefly highlighting their results and sort of summarizing the excitement surrounding their announcement as a way to, uh, to motivate today's discussion. And then I, I'm going to hand it over to Derek, and he's going to discuss the difference between efficacy and effectiveness using the results of the trials to demonstrate our doubts about their ability to um, uh, achieve meaningful, sustainable population health effects. He's then going to discuss the fallacy of prioritizing efficacy over adherence, which we believe is one of the biggest problems with the discussion surrounding these microbicide trials recently. And then, actually, I think these, uh, these didn't get switched. I'm going to discuss um, biomedicalization of public health and its implications for this research and this research field and sort of end with presenting one theory of health behavior that we think may help us reinterpret the results of these trials and also help um, motivate a renewed interest and a renewed impetus in structural interventions. So as I'm sure this audience is well aware, uh, Caprisa and IPRACS were published to great acclaim in 2010. They were both uh, double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trials, and Caprisa documented a 39% reduction in the incidence of HIV infection among women using the Tenofovir-based antiviral microbicide gel. IPREX found a 44% reduction in HIV incidence among men and trans women who have sex with men using oral Trixitabin and tenofovir combination therapy. And so, you know, it, it, in the history of microbicide trials, you know, these results were quite remarkable because, uh, you know, over the previous 20 years, 11 different trials have been, not been able to demonstrate any efficacy in preventing new HIV infections. And so accordingly, you know, they received many accolades. Um, here you can see a screenshot of uh, the New York Times coverage of Caprita. They were, so they were both actually picked up on the front page of the New York Times. Um, they were given quotes by U.S. President Barack Obama, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's the director of the NAAID, and they've been met with standing ovations and cheers at defense conference presentations. So without belaboring the point too much, here you can see the screenshot of the, the New York Times coverage of IPREX. The gel and, and PrEP are, are being sold as game changers, as watershed moments in this fight against HIV. And the impetus behind uh, writing our paper and our thinking on the subject isn't that these are useless developments. They actually... Uh, are quite useful treatment modalities, but we believe these uh, are not sustainable population health solutions in and of themselves, and being sold as such, we believe these trials are excellent examples of the conflation of biomedicine and public health. So over the next couple of slides, um, we're going to highlight the data that led us to this conclusion. And so now I'm going to pass it off to Derek. Um, so first what I'm going to do is just to clarify how we and other folks use uh, efficacy and effectiveness. And so when we say efficacy, what we're talking about is the reduction in the risk associated with the full and complete implementation of the intervention. Um, and then on the other side, when we say effectiveness, we're talking about the reduction in risk associated with the intervention as it actually gets implemented in the real world. So practically, this means that while efficacy might be related to a specific intervention, um, and the example that we use in our paper is that um, when we use condoms consistently and as they're intended to be used, we can prevent upwards of 90% of pregnancies. But effectiveness is about how the condoms actually get used in the real world. And so to extend this example, not all women use condoms correctly or consistently, and so this rate looks closer to 85% in the United States, for example. So RCTs, or randomized control trials, are, are often kind of lauded as the gold standard for, for evidence. And the question that we raise is, is the gold standard for what? And, of course, I don't want to argue that they, they're probably the best tool we have to yield invaluable efficacy data 
and proving that, in this case, the gel or the pill reduced risk of HIV infection. But it's really incumbent upon effectiveness trials or basically studies that see how people use these interventions in the real world that their public health significance can be revealed. And so the questions here that these two kinds of trials ask are very different. You know, so what these trials have done a good job of answering is, you know, if individuals use the gel or, or take the pill as appropriate, does it reduce their likelihood of HIV infection? But from a public health perspective, we have to be concerned with the question, if we disseminate this gel or this pill in the population, will it actually re result in a reduction in the rate of HIV infections? And what we're arguing is that the, the current nature of how we do science prioritizes the randomized control trial, we can never appropriately, or it's hard for us to do those studies that get at the second question, which we think is uh, incredibly important. And, and Eric will talk more about kind of what we mean by biomedicalization of public health later. But, but my point really is that it's limited our ability to, to kind of really think in privileged structural interventions as a way to improve population health. And so what I'm going to do is go on to talk about a few areas where I think the over-reliance on the randomized control trial might have caused us to inappropriately value the results from, from these two studies. And so the first thing that, that I think folks are, are pretty kind of intuitively aware of is that, first of all, the, the people who kind of volunteer to sign up for a randomized control trial are probably inherently different than those who did not volunteer. And so it limits our ability to, to kind of extrapolate data to the rest of the population. And so for kind of the research methods um, folks in the world, you know, so it's, it limits our ability to establish external validity. You know, so in, in this case, for example, they may be more motivated to use the gel or the pill as prescribed. Secondly, both of these trials had a lot of what I call moving parts, which, which makes it difficult for them to, which makes it difficult for us to discern if it was really kind of the gel or the pill or if it was a combination of the gel or the pill with these things such as motivational interviewing, which was used to kind of help people correctly implement, implement the, the use of the intervention. Um, and I want to just be clear for a second here, you know, if, if I were to run a randomized control trial myself, I would have made the exact same choice. You know, I think it's important that for people who do volunteer to be in these randomized control trials, that we support them to use the interventions that we're giving them as, as best as we can. But what we want to raise is the point is that this has consequences for the information that we get from these studies. And perhaps one of the greatest kind of ironies of the trials, particularly with IPREX and the antiretrovirals that they prescribe to, to men of sex with men, is the recognition that cost is a substantial barrier. And so, again, appropriately, these trials provided these pills for free. Um, again, appropriate, but it should give us pause as to the study recognized this as an important barrier, but then, you know, we, we need to be concerned with well, if cost is a barrier that needed to be overcome in the trial, how, would, what, how is that barrier going to be addressed kind of once the trial is over if we want to roll this out in the rest of the population? And so what I'm going to show the next couple slides are estimates of the time that it takes for, H, for HIV infection in, in both of these trials. And so you can see here in the, the top line, the dashed line, which is the placebo, and the solid line on the bottom, was the, the tenofovir gel. And the, the difference in incidence was, was quickly pretty apparent with a 50% lower incidence of HIV among women using the gel 12 months into the trial. And we see this effect maintained, but we do see that that difference could, does shorten over time to, to 39%. And similarly with with the IPREX trial, the, the MSM trial, we see there's a large gap, specifically here in between weeks 84 and 108. 
Um, but then again, these lines get closer, indicating that the difference between the placebo group and the intervention group shrinks. And so, you know, we see these kind of waning effects in other HIV behavior change prevention trials. And so we were, we're also just concerned about kind of what could be driving these two groups to look more similar as time goes on in the trial. And so kind of one thing that we think is going on here that's really important to highlight is adherence. And so and by adherence, I just mean, you know, how well are people actually using the microbicide gel or kind of how well are they taking the pill that, that's been prescribed to them. And so what we can see here in the Caprisa trial, so for those who use the gel more than 80% of the time, they saw an effect, and that's, and that's great. And that's kind of the evidence that we want to see in an efficacy trial. You know, if you use the product, you see an effect. If you don't use the product, you don't see an effect. That's what we would expect to see. But arguably the more important point that we've highlighted here in the red boxes is that while people who used the gel saw an effect, most of the people in the trial didn't actually adhere the way, had uh, less than optimal adherence. So they were using the gel less than 80% of the time, and so the majority of people enrolled in the study actually didn't reap any benefit from, from this gel. And similarly in uh, IPREX, we, we see a, a similar result. And, and what they did here is they asked folks, basically, did you take the drug half the time or, you know, half the time or more or less than half the time? And what we saw was that for people, even when they said they took, they were taking these drugs half the time, that only 8% of the HIV positive sample and 54% of the HIV negative sample actually had any measurable amounts of drugs in their system. And so even in the context of this tightly controlled randomized control trial, we're not doing a really good job of getting people to actually use the product as, as we intend. And so one thing that we're really arguing for is that it's time that when we think about trials that we spend just as much effort testing the effects of these, of, of these drugs as we do testing kind of how people use them in the real world. And so this brings us to our point where in one of our papers we say adherence doesn't belong buried in the discussion section, which is to say that, you know, we think there's a problematic and systematic kind of devaluation of actual human behavior. We think this is particularly problematic, especially when, as we saw in the last few slides, the efficacy of these interventions is a function of how much people use them, which is something we might expect. Um, but almost paradoxically, the adherence concern remains secondary to the efficacy. And so what we're arguing is that kind of how or to what extent people actually use these interventions is it kind of an inextricable component of the intervention package, but it's one that randomized control trials uh, measure but don't kind of sufficiently assess. Um, and additionally, it, it kind of gets written off as, you know, well, these interventions work really well when people use them without kind of acknowledging the kind of upfront fact that, well, people aren't using them as you as, as they're as we might hope, and that in itself is an important thing. Um, and so an extreme example of this is abstinence and abstinence-only education, um, right? So we know that not having sex is very efficacious at preventing pregnancy, right? If you don't have sex, you're not going to get pregnant. But abstinence-only education is probably one of the least effective pregnancy prevention programs out there, you know? And to kind of wildly generalize, the reason is People don't adhere to this intervention, right? You can tell people to be abstinent all you want, um, but if they don't use your intervention as designed, then it doesn't really matter kind of how efficacious it is. Um, and so this leaves us kind of with two options. You know, we need to either improve the adherence to the intervention or we need to recognize that our intervention won't have kind of population level effects and may just be useful in very specific contexts. And that's what we are saying is currently the case with these trials. We have these interventions which have demonstrated the possibility for efficacy, 
but seem to have severe adherence problems and problems that we argue are actually being underestimated by the trial. And again, in the sake of fairness, you know, this isn't untrue for condoms as well, you know, although we would argue condoms at least boast a kind of a greater efficacy. And, and you know, the, the value of the gel and the pill is that we can't get people to use condoms consistently. And so this is another kind of um, tool in our toolkit for HIV prevention, precisely because we can't seem to get people to use condoms more consistently. However, I think an appropriate structural perspective of the point kind of raises what, what we think is kind of the, the key issue here, is that the context that prevents people from using condoms consistently is the exact same context which is going to prevent and limit people from using the microbicide gel and the pill consistently as well. So Eric is going to take over again. Right. Thank you, Derek. So, you know, the question for us then is why is adherence to interventions considered an ancillary concern to establishing efficacy, and how will understanding this lead us to consider structural interventions as a crucial component to achieving sustainable population health effects? So, you know, we see this largely as a, the result of biomedical thinking, and in particular, the conflation of biomedicine with public health. So to begin, I want to define medicalization as the process by which human conditions come to be understood and treated as medical conditions, particularly conditions that weren't originally understood to fall under the purview of biology. So biomedicalization, as opposed to medicalization, refers specifically to the role of technology in clinical practice. So our increasing tendency to catalog conditions as medical problems and then prescribe some form of technology to, can, to cure that uh, condition. So we oftentimes see examples of this in revisions of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So, for example, the most recent edition listed caffeine withdrawal as a mental disorder. So, more importantly for our purposes here, the biomedical model of disease asks questions about individuals. So, what caused this instance of disease? What can treat this individual? And what could have prevented this case? And we argue that public health should at least, or should be concerned with populations and aggregates of individual health states what causes rates of disease, and how do we prevent disease from occurring in populations. So if you think back to one of Derek's first slides, it's sort of this contrast between these two questions. And what I argue, and you know, what other people have documented um, in some of the preliminary readings that we passed out, is that the modern incarnation of public health has embodied biomedical thinking, and we can see this manifest in, uh, in different forms. So for example, the black box era of epidemiology which uh, looks for risk factors for chronic disease outcomes without really understanding what's going on uh, uh, underneath the system or inside the black box. And also the development of psychological reductionist models of health behavior that really focus on uh, uh, individual deficiencies of education or individual intrapsychic barriers to engaging in health behaviors. And so we argue that the, the biomedicalization of public health um, is predicated on respecting the autonomy of individuals. So it's the models of, of health care that we have now and the public health that we have are to provide opportunities for individuals to improve their health while respecting their choice of whether or not to take advantage of that opportunity. So part of the problem is that an orientation that's primarily concerned with the autonomy of individuals would naturally focus on efficacy over effectiveness because it lacks sufficient concern about aggregate levels of health. And, uh, you know, this orientation also guides our research efforts towards individual solutions to ameliorate individual risk factors. Um, and biomedical interventions are very well poised to address this and fill this gap. Um, so to see the, the disconnect between how we think this uh, biomedical approach to a public health problem manifests, we are conducting all these trials in so-called high-risk groups. So groups that are um, have incidents of HIV so that we have enough endpoints in our trials to establish efficacy, and they are high risk consider, uh, they're considered high risk because of some sort of social status that demarcates them as such. And we are essentially searching for medical solutions in populations defined by a pattern of disease connected to their social experience. So before really moving on, I want to 
just make a couple points. So, so why are we pointing a finger at biomedicine, and why do we why do we care to 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 make this point? And so, I think it's important to have this discussion because there's a lot at stake. So, many medicalized and biomedicalized approaches to HIV prevention have been found wanting. So, as a pragmatic science, public health has an interest in identifying sustainable population health solutions, and Frankly, biomedicalization isn't really oriented towards identifying this. Um, but I, 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 again, want to reiterate that we're not trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater here. We think that these developments hold promise and that there is a place for this sort of research and that the, uh, the gel and the pill can fill important niches. However, we do want to push the field of HIV research in particular to distinguish between these individualized medical solutions and sustainable populate, population health solution. And second, uh, the paradigm through which we view the world dictates how we identify problems, the questions we ask, and the solutions we envision. So importantly, these paradigms are moving targets and have and will continue to change over time. So with the benefit of hindsight, we can learn from past eras. And, uh, you know, we have seen uh, a, sh a shift occurring within epidemiology and within public health generally to sort of reinscribe sociological thinking into it. And uh, over the next couple slides, I just want to briefly describe one theory of health behavior that we hope um, can bring new impetus to implement structural interventions, but also demonstrate why we think the context that creates low adherence is to these interventions is the same context which creates low adherence to common use, for example. So as I mentioned, one of the, the hangovers from biomedicalization of public health is the dominance of these psychological reduction theories of health behavior. So the stage of the change model, the trans theoretical model, the health belief model, these things are overwhelmingly focused on individual psychology. And they're primarily aimed to increase knowledge of health risks or overcome these intrapsychic barriers. And I think we sell ourselves short by assuming uh, that informing individuals of health risks is sufficient to bring about changes in behavior. So, in fact, there are large bodies of work devoted to understanding the patterning of human behaviors. And as I will detail a bit later, the current era of public health scholarship concentrates on theories rooted in this individual psychology. However, we would do well to collectively remember that other bodies of work have engaged this question from alternative perspectives. So, sociology, for example, has long debated the relative contribution of individual choice in producing behaviors. As I'm sure uh, this audience well knows, this takes the form of a debate between uh, the relative contribution of agency and structure in producing behavior. So here, we're just going to loosely define agency as free will, so it's the capacity of individuals to choose behavior regardless of any sorts of constraints. And I'm going to loosely define structure as uh, conditions which foster individual dispositions to engage in particular behavior. So it's the patterning of individual choices. And uh, Comprehensive review of the sociological literature uh, on this debate is, is not our purposes here today, but um, I do think it's important to highlight that this debate centers on a relative contribution of agency versus structure. So meaning that there is essentially consensus that structures do pattern behavior in important ways, and that I think that this point is often overlooked in a lot of these um, RCTs and in a lot of these trials and in discussion of how people use these in the real world. These are often seen as issues of agency, of people not choosing to use a particular intervention for whatever reason. And there is sort of a, a shunting of structure to the side. And so uh, I just want to highlight uh, one one theory that I think is uh, helpful in in, in re-engaging this debate. And so William Cockerham's health lifestyle theory uh, is what I want to present next. So here I just reproduced a figure from his paper, which uh, uh, was published in 2005. The citation is at the bottom if you are interested. Um, so briefly, uh, different structures, for example, class, race, gender, uh, probabilistically shape our life chances. Um, for example, what schools you go to, but also influence our socialization experiences. You know, this usually falls under the rubric of culture. Um, and the interplay of these, or 
desocialization experiences influence the choices we make. And the interplay of life chances and life choices create our dispositions to engage in behavior, right? So, um, and then whether or not we choose to engage in the behavior creates feedback to the person that leads to reproduction, modification, or nullification of these habits, right? So if we apply this to the behaviors implicated in the transmission of HIV, which is typically sex and drug use, we can begin to understand how the context which creates low rates of consistent condom use is the same context which will prevent consistent prophylaxis use, which is why we have reduced enthusiasm for these modalities to become sustainable population health solutions. So um, as an example, let's think about the sugar daddy phenomenon. So two-thirds of HIV or people living with HIV are in sub-Saharan Africa. 60% of these people are women, and 45% of them are between the ages of 15 and 24. And uh, a lot of the research that has uh, addressed this has implicated extreme poverty as one of the, the main driving factors. And so the sugar daddy phenomenon is, is such that young women in, uh, enter into romantic relationships with older men that can provide them with money or gifts. So the problem is that in these relationships, there's little room to negotiate economies, and moreover, uh, the extreme poverty, which creates this impetus to enter into these relationships, dictates that there is no money to purchase the gel and hence consistently use it. And interestingly, at the same time that the Caprisa results were released, there was uh, the results of the cash transfer program from Malawi was released that found... Um, an adjusted odds ratio of 0.36 for HIV endpoints, just for giving uh, girls and families a monetary incentive to stay in school. So a corollary of uh, the health lifestyle theory is that a sustainable way to achieve population improvements in HIV incidents would be to target the structures implicated in the development and maintenance of these so-called deleterious health behaviors. So just to wrap up, um, Caprisa and IPREX results were heralded as watershed moments in the fight against HIV. However, their efficacy was largely a function of adherence, which means these modalities may not be sustainable population health interventions. If we treat adherence as a secondary concern to efficacy, which is largely a product of biomedical thinking, which is concerned with the causes of, and treatment of individual cases rather than rates of disease in populations, we think we're going to continue to be uh, stymied in reducing the incidence of HIV at the population level. Um, alternative theories of health behavior that do a better job incorporating the influence of social structures, for example, the context of human behavior, uh, can help us demonstrate the reasons underpinning non-adherence to both condoms and non-adherence to chemoprophylactic intervention, which we hope serves to renew an impetus to enact these structural interventions. How do you do trials that measure effectiveness? And he would argue that biomed scientists have gotten the memo about it here. So I just want to um, how he's arguing that biomedical scientists uh, understand the issues with adherence. Yes. Okay. So just to answer the, the latter part of that question, um, I've seen uh, several presentations on IPREX and also Caprisa, and, you know, Slim, Slim will get up and actually say that these interventions work if only we can get people to use them. So it is, I think that they understand that adherence is important, but it's treated as this ancillary concern of, well, you know, we just, it's the individual's fault for not using it. And on top of that, there is, there's also this uh, a second vein uh, discussion in the literature that says, well, we should just implement uh, biomedical and behavioral interventions. And so what you see is you know, both of these trials included a lot of behavioral help, but we still have very low adherence uh, efforts. 62% of the people in Caprice were uh, below optimal levels. And part of the, the point
point in highlighting the waning effects over time is that there is sort of trial um, weariness, and we think that that is um, a problem as well. Right. Um, I'm going to follow up with that question because I, I think I think it is coming from both worlds, the ones that are critiquing biomedical prevention as well as someone who comes from the world of biomedical prevention. Um, I think there is a lot of appreciation among some sectors. Um, I think that in general there was uh, less appreciation by some people about the importance that adherence would play, although many of us and many advocates and many uh, advocate scientists were from uh, the very beginning talking about the fact that the, the true thing was going to be adherence and use. So I think it's I think the reality is nuanced that there's some people who don't understand it and there's a great group that do understand it. One of the dilemmas I think that the field faced, um, especially with something like microbicide, is that it's a new product class, so it doesn't exist. It has to be proven to actually work in order to actually even be licensed. Where um, unlike PrEP, the oral dose, which exists in the world, is a licensed drug and is being just used in a new application. Um, if you have something that actually cannot be delivered at all, you can't test it for effect. You can't test it for a more real-world effectiveness until you pass through the loop of um, getting it approved. So, you know, I think that that we you know we have both people who understand that as well as sort of your critique i think at its heart is very true is that there's uh, a hope that there will be you know that these things will have a population impact perhaps greater than than we want and just as a final observation if we took the initial adherence to contraception as our metric, uh, we wouldn't have successful valley planning programs today. And so there's always this, this, this dilemma between recognizing that any user controlled method is going to have adherence issues. I mean, even if you look at statins and, and all sorts of other things, you know, 50% of people who use, who are prescribed treatments don't use them. But you can actually successfully get to a level that has a population impact, but it may take 20 or 30 years. So I just throw those out to, to add to the, to the discussion. I think you raised some really, really great points there, um, particularly I think about kind of the novelty, uh, you, you know, because the, the question then, of course, becomes, you know, I, I think the equally problematic if, you know, change would be, you know, to kind of prioritize, you know, the effectiveness of interventions without any regard for their kind of efficacy, and we certainly don't want to kind of move in that direction either. Um, you know, I think a really kind of interesting um, approach, um, so we, we cited this in our original paper, but um, in the American Journal of Public Health, Steckler and McLeroy, um, probably about five years ago, um, kind of proposed a model where the kind of, at least the, the scientific process, at least kind of as it works in the United States, um, basically whereby, you know, efficacy trials kind of would still be kind of chronologically first, but then immediately after kind of effectiveness data would kind of then need to be produced before kind of these conversations about really dissemination got underway. And, and I think um, for us, the, the kind of the primary concern isn't so much, you know, like, you know, I would love to be proven wrong, you know, quite frankly, you know, all we have are doubts, you know, we don't, we don't have really great data about effectiveness. And I think someone just kind of also mentioned the, the point, um, you know, now that we know these things do work, like maybe we'll see um, women in MSM like use these products increasingly. Um, you know, we, we can't know that until we get the data. Um, you know, I think what we're trying to really push for, though, is let's not kind of 
over lean on efficacy data to kind of make those conclusions about the promise of interventions when we really need to really kind of think about both kinds of data uh, a little bit more in tandem as opposed to kind of them being, as opposed to effectiveness trials kind of be really treated as a secondary concern. Well, just particularly because, you know, I feel like the recognition of adherence was then pushed to the side because people sort of figured out that, well, let's roll these out with behavioral interventions as well. And there are lots of problems associated with behavioral interventions as well. All right. So um, does someone want to venture a, a, a question on the line? Come on, someone be brave. Okay, so um, we have one question. Or do you want to take the next question that you see on your chat field? Let's see, one second. Um, I see, I'm saying a bunch of questions here, actually. So, well, pick one. Uh, <laughs> um, How do, uh, I guess, just generally here, how do, how do we, like, I guess, how to test effectiveness? Um, I think hopefully that will, that will kind of just, I think, open up some, um, you know, so I guess uh, the issue with effectiveness and how to test it, um, you know, and certainly, like, you know, I'm not about to kind of reveal some, some golden answer here, but, um, it, you know, I think what it, it would re involves is uh, kind of more observational studies in nature as opposed to kind of the, the tightly controlled efficacy trials. Um, again, I don't think one trial can kind of test both of them perfectly in, in, together. Um, again, what we're just simply kind of arguing for is uh, – before we kind of jump on the the like the microbicide or the IPREX will be the game changer, you know, yes, let's establish the efficacy in RCT and then let's um, let, let's at least you know kind of get these uh, smaller observational studies to see how people are using them. And, and I'm more personally more familiar with PrEP, um, and we are seeing a lot of those studies coming out or at least being implemented right now. Um, so I think we're going to get a lot of good effectiveness data, um, and you know, and then I think we'll be at a much better place to kind of argue for whether or not um, the, these work. Uh, I'm trying to. Do, 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 do. Yeah. This is Anna. Can I say something? Sure, please. Lori, hi, this is Anna Forbes. I'm based in Washington, D.C. Um, I just wanted to sort of comment and ask a question also. Um, it, it has seemed to me for a while as though, <clears throat> excuse me, um, part of the uh, fallacy of prioritizing efficacy over adherence, as you put it, uh, has to do with uh, who is involved in the field and who is uh, at the table. Um, the last resources tracking study that was done on how much was being spent on research on microbicides and PrEP and so forth uh, showed that as far as the microbicide field is concerned, only 3% of the uh, funding is going toward um, uh, social and behavioral research. And I think we've seen consistently a real shortage in investment uh, in social and behavioral research as part of these RTCs. And I think that that you know, while that is not, you know, a completely a, cure, a solution for addressing structural issues more, I think that greater investment and in social and behavioral research would certainly point us in the direction uh, more clearly of uh, the impact that um, social factors or social, that structural factors rather are having on this. And I wondered if you all could comment on that. I actually couldn't agree more. I think that um, to follow up on Derek's comment, a, a very easy way to to ameliorate this problem would be to include, like, for example, a qualitative component about how people in the trial are actually using these products. 
then the, the trick is then to take that data and actually meaningfully examine it and think about solutions to overcome that. So part of the problem is that structure is this very nebulous concept. Structural interventions are sort of like not well understood even within fields of sociologists, things like that, people that think about this a lot. Um, in our paper, we, we cite a couple good, good examples or papers that we think uh, do a good job laying this out, but the problem is there are lots of moving targets. There are lots of upstream factors that we can intervene on, um, and part of the problem is going to be, A, being able to identify them, um, but then also mobilizing effort behind actually meaningfully addressing these once we identify them. And to piggyback on what um, was actually mentioned kind of when we were introduced, you know, I heard kind of one of the kind of interesting recognitions was that, you know, a lot of these structural drivers, you know, aren't limited to HIV by any means, you know, certainly. Um, and I think that's also kind of where even kind of the fundamentals of our methods and how we fund research are kind of limited. You know, we tend to get funded and examine things kind of one state at a time. Um, and, you know, kind of the power of structural interventions is that we can kind of influence a lot of different outcomes at once, but we might not be able to kind of see those effects if we look kind of at outcomes in isolation as easily, right? So if we have this amazing structural intervention that kind of lowers HIV incidence, it lowers rate of unintended pregnancy, it increases educational, you know, we, we may kind of miss that it's doing these things kind of in concert when we are looking kind of myopically at one outcome at once. But again, that's that's typically how we get funded. We get kind of funded on the outcome side as opposed to the kind of social context side of the equation. Um, so I think that's another important thing for us to, to keep in mind. Um, and that may be one way to kind of ultimately try to get additional funding for structural interventions is the recognition that you know, maybe we need to think kind of not at the outcome aside so much as, as kind of what are the conditions that are creating all the outcomes that we're funded to, to look at. You know, one of the things which I, I would say STRIVE is trying to do in, in light of both uh, the questions or the observations that you've made is, is, is twofold. One is to try to fund so more social science in the context of large uh, combination prevention trials of new biomedical technologies uh, so that we have a better handle on what structural barriers uh, may be influencing people's willingness to adhere or test or the like. So, for example, in the large pop art trial, which is, is studying the effectiveness of treatment as prevention and with community, uh, community based testing, uh, we're funding and working to put in elements related to alcohol use, stigma, and, and violence so that we actually have that data. Um, I think it's important to recognize though that, that most of these trials, even the efficacy trials, in the HIV prevention field do have social science. They don't have as much social science as I think many of us would like to see, but they do study adherence and, and some have had quite fulsome programs of trying to understand who uses it and why and what. Um, I do think the critique that you guys raise is, is particularly relevant at a paradigm level. So, if you, if you actually look at where money's going and how we think about these things. So we have another program of research under Strive that's looking at trying to document what we're calling development synergies. So as you say, the structural interventions influence multiple outcomes, and yet our methods for establishing the cost effectiveness, for example, of a particular intervention it always look at a single outcome. Um, so we will look at different methods and compare them across their impact on HIV, putting all of the cost of the intervention in the HIV account, but not looking at the fact that there may be multiple benefits on pregnancy and STIs and, and all sorts of other things. 
Um, and so how do we change our methodologies so that they are not barriers to more structural thinking? Um, we have a, a question here for, or a, a comment, I guess, from um, Justin uh, Parker, who says, another potential reason for prioritization or more effort spent on efficacy versus adherence is the generalizability or external validity issues on socially determined mechanisms. And I think what he means by that is that there's so many different things and they vary so much by setting. The biomedical trials have generalizability as the mechanism of effect is biochemical. Um, therefore, the results of an efficacy trial can more typically be generalized and remain over time. Any adherence trial is totally context, time, and location specific, so it frustrates decision makers and public health planners because they can't be given a reliable estimate of how much they will gain uh, in their particular setting. I don't know if you guys want to comment on either of those two two observations. I, mean, I think that's so. a fantastic point. Um, you know, like I know it again on the U.S. side, um, the CDC spends a lot of or had spent a lot of kind of effort um, evaluating uh, behavioral interventions so that they could kind of really put the gold stamp of kind of efficacy on these interventions. Um, but then, you know, it came with, a, like, a lot of caveats, kind of like, well, it might not work in this population, or this was evaluated 10 years ago, and, and it really kind of frustrated people. Um, and, and I think you, you know, Justin's kind of hit the nail on the head there. Like, um, it, yeah, I mean, I don't know <laughs> what else to yeah. say. But, um, you, you know, it's, it's on one hand, like, you know, we can't necessarily, you know, it would almost be, it would be irresponsible, I would argue, to probably try to do an effectiveness study, like, for every single, you know, at some point, you kind of just have to go with the information you have, um, you know, and that's a, a line we have to find a better balance towards, but um, I do think it needs to be moved a little bit closer uh, towards kind of incorporating context and, and effectiveness, um, but I mean... Yeah, I mean, it's hard not to be sympathetic with that with that concern. Can I interrupt for a second? It's Annie here. We um, Jim would like to make a comment at this time. We should finish in the next couple of minutes, but um, maybe you'd like to go ahead, Jim, and unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. 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 Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks for an interesting slide and an interesting discussion. I just have a couple of points um, I'll make really quickly. Um, first, I mean, it occurs to me, and it has occurred to me, that we have advocates for treatment, we have advocates for prevention. We don't have ab advocates for implementation science necessarily, and that's sort of where we, that's where a lot of these questions are going to be asked. I, I don't know how a biomedical prevention trial can answer all the questions we need, but an implementation project, demonstration project, that's where we start to figure out how people actually use it in, quote, the real world outside of the structures of RCT. And there's very few of us who are pushing for that, or there's not a whole lot of constituency around that. I think it's high time we have one. Secondly, um, I sort of struggle with this idea of effectiveness in an RCT and how you do it. And I think back to, and this has been, I've heard these in other consultations, but most recently I was at a consultation for transgender men and women around rectal microbicide development. And... You know, they were all they were all there, and they were interested in rectal microbicides, but they said, you know, if you want to give us an HIV prevention intervention, you, you don't need to do a, a trial. We don't need to have anything fancy. We, we don't have to do any kind of fancy science. We need jobs. We need to be employed. We need to be stably housed. We need to uh, have food in our stomach. Um, but mainly, like, we need to be hired, and it's really hard to get hired when you're a transgender person. Um, and if you gave us a job, our risk level right there goes down. So these are huge issues around employment, poverty, agency in the in the culture and in society. I'm not sure exactly how a biomedical prevention trial has can really engage with that on any deep level, um, other than hiring lots and lots of people for the trial. But you know what I'm saying? Like these are huge issues, and I'm not sure how the trial can incorporate enough of those to be meaningful. That's where I'm kind of struggling with this conversation. I, I mean, I, I think that that's an excellent point. Um, 
part of the the problem is that we didn't really discuss. I mean, we were sort of limited by space, really limited in what we can do. But um, you know, who who benefits from these structural interventions and who uh, loses from these structural interventions? And to put it plainly, there's a lot of vested interest in keeping the status quo. And so we can think about the cost of ARVs. You know, someone raised the, the point earlier that in Peru, uh, I think it was you, Jim, um, Truvada is not even on the formulary list. So even if, you know, we do demonstrate efficacy, how do we then get this to the people? And that's, you know, that's something that may be beyond public health, but that uh, we did want people to start thinking about because these are – we can't just roll these interventions out and assume it's going to take this effect. There are these other issues that are going on with people. I would also add that I think as we've been trying to think about how to assist public health and HIV programs to integrate more structural thinking into their combination prevention, there's a real, there's a real disconnect between the skill set and the way HIV funding and prevent uh, interventions work and the skill set and what is needed to actually shift things structurally. So, you know, the skill set of people who do programming for HIV, um, are, there tend not to be advocates. It's a political process that's needed. Um, many of these changes are not technocratic. They're political and they require political shifts um, or they require at least major programmatic commitments from other ministries, whether it be, you know, education or whatever. And yet all of our funding and all of the structure at which uh, decision-making happens happens by sector. Um, so, you know, I think we're, I think the, the challenge is great and, um, but I think as Jim said, I think more of us, if we can start to put our heads together and, and strategize and really at least identify the, the failures or the, the, the problems that the current system has for actually pushing forward with a structural agenda, um, you know, I think that we can start to, to make some progress. So I think we're going to have to stop, but I, I, I think it's been an interesting conversation and, and hopefully the beginning of, of uh, a longer conversation between prevention advocates working on, you know, biomedical prevention and some of us who are now trying to start to think a bit more about uh, structural causes. Um, I just want to let people know that we post these um, podcasts, these learning labs of videos on the STRIVE website, uh, which you can reach through www.strive.lshtm or slash lshtm, and uh, that should be up in about a week or so. So um, I want to thank Eric and Derek and uh, encourage anyone – who would like to participate in future Strive uh, uh, calls to sign up on the webpage or um, when they ask to be signed up when you get your little follow-up email asking you about your participation. So with that, I think I will close today and um, uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. <laughs>